The following program contains graphic medical images. Viewer discretion is advised. Today on Dr. Phil, a bitter divorce. He was angry and wanted me back. An unthinkable act. I was shot and killed my son. Shot myself. When her husband snapped. How did this happen? He thought that it would destroy me if he hurt the children. Her world collapsed. I miss them every day. How are you coping with this now? Plus. I saw him grab the AK-47. Was it PTSD? I believe that he did try to murder me. Or is their entire marriage? And these children were in harm's way. A powder keg. Did you run over him with a car? I hit him, but it wasn't intentional. Should you have gotten out of this relationship a long time ago? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. I hate to see people suffering, and you've hurt long enough. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Full second. I'm going to get you the help that you need. Five, four, this is going to be a changing day in your life. Go, Dr. Phil. I want you to take a look at something with me. Look at this cell phone exchange. The friend says, you okay? Samantha, I am at the moment, but who knows when he's gonna explode again? Friend, do you want me to come get you to at least get away for the day? Samantha, well, he left. I don't know where he went. Do you wanna come hang here with me? Friend, honestly, I'm scared if he comes back and I'm there. The last time I was there, he was mad that I was there. Samantha, okay then. Friend, I'll come get you and bring you here, but you just said he was threatening to kill you with an AK-47. You shouldn't even be there. You should want to leave. Sadly, my first guest, Samantha, didn't leave. And eventually, the inevitable, Adam and I have been married for four years. We have a six-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. When Adam first got back from Iraq and was discharged from the service, everything was great. It wasn't until a few months into him being home where things just really started to get very bad for us. He was drinking and using drugs, and then we began to fight all the time. I would be called ugly, nobody loved me, my family hates me, my son doesn't like me. There was an incident where he had a handgun and threatened to kill himself and then pointed it at me and threatened to kill me as well. After he threatened me the first time with the gun, he disappeared for a week with his friends. One day Adam and I were fighting about our finances. He had said he would shoot me. I didn't believe him. I thought he was just venting. After we argued, he left for approximately eight and a half hours. When he came home, he was walking around the house just calling me horrible names. And all I remember is standing at the bedroom door and I saw him grab the AK-47. And when I went to turn, that's when he shot me in my lower left leg. I at first was in shock and I said to him, what the, you just shot me. The barrel of the gun was probably this close to my leg. I'll never forget the look in his face after he shot me the first time. It was a look of pure satisfaction. It was like he had the devil inside. I thought that he was gonna kill me. I was shaking so bad that I wasn't able to get my phone unlocked to dial 911. And I turned to sit on the bed and then that's when he took the second shot in the back of my right leg. He grabbed the phone out of my hand and threw it against the wall and broke it. I was begging him to please call 911 that if I didn't lose my leg, I was gonna die. There was so much blood. Finally, he called 911. I was just screaming for help in the background. Help me, please help me. There was 55 minutes in between the time that he shot me and the time that the SWAT team and paramedics were able to come into my home. That 55 minutes was the worst time of my life. I've never been more terrified. Adam is currently charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. I believe that he did try to murder me.
Samantha has had five surgeries and skin grafts to her legs and face. It's been a long road to recovery, but she is here today. So Samantha, please come on out. Samantha, it's good to meet you. I am so sorry what has happened to you. That's not right. It's not fair. There's no reason. There's no justification, validation, or anything um, that can be said that puts this in a context or makes it okay. Tell me how you're doing physically. I'm very challenged. Um, this is the new reality that I have to live with. I will be able to walk again, uh -huh. but it's going to take a long time of physical therapy and a lot of work. Right. Life will never be the same for Samantha. She now struggles daily with partial paralysis and navigating the world from a wheelchair. Let's take a look at that and then we'll talk. The shooting happened a little over a month ago, and since then I have fallen into every challenge. I have to learn to live my life all over again. It, it's hard. I constantly have to rely on other people to take me places. I haven't been okay to drive yet. Just pull that chair out so I can sit there until we can get a sock for my foot. Thankfully, my right leg is healed. As far as my left leg goes, I'm missing a huge part of muscle. My leg is deformed. I'm looking at three to six months of physical therapy before I'm able to walk again. It's a huge struggle to function without being able to use my legs. I can hardly get dressed myself. Is that okay? You're just gonna try and get a bigger sock? I have to use a walker to go to the bathroom. I'm bound to the wheelchair. I can't take showers by myself. The biggest emotional challenge has been trying to wrap my head around how someone who claims to be in love with me could do such a horrific thing to me. I try to be optimistic, but this has brought a huge depression in my life. Why do you think this happened? I honestly don't know why this happened. I don't think anybody except for him will ever know why it happened. When I looked back at this, I wrote down some things to ask you if you thought, taken as a whole, that you missed some warning signs here. You're, you're saying he's spending money that you need for family and children on drugs and hotels, right? That's correct. Then, it was about that time, it's the first time that he pulled a gun and threatened to kill you. Yes. Now, soon after, you kick him out, but not about the gun. You kick him out because he's not paying the bills and taking care of the kids. He's not, he's not being a husband. He's he wasn't not, being a husband right. or a father. Then, we go to July of 13. You tell a friend that, that he said he wants to kill you. You called the police, you had him arrested uh, about a gun. He makes bail and you allow him back in. Tell me why. He started to go get help. He was making his appointments. He was, for the most part, you know, better at home with me, with the kids. And it wasn't until he started using again that he took another turn for the worst and then it just, he never came back from that. And there was a lot of non-physical violence that took place. That he, he always had an attitude. He broke your grandmother's table, ripped pictures off the wall, called you every name in the book, put you down as a mother. My wife, Robin, who you haven't met, um, has really dedicated this phase of her life to helping women in domestic violence situations. Um, and is the ambassador for our In the Silence on Domestic Violence program. And, you know, Robin, one of the things I heard you talking about, I think it was in an interview just the other day, domestic violence isn't always physical, that it can be mental and emotional as well, right? Have you been surprised how many women don't realize that it's risen to the level of abuse and think this is just the way you live? Yes, yes, and, and sadly, only one in four women even re report abuse because a lot of them don't even know they're being abused. So they just stay at home and they just take it. Now, 
in, in this situation, she is essentially describing you at different points. You, you never said to yourself when you guys were going back and forth and he was being ugly and saying things, that wasn't something that you considered actionable, criminal. It was just kind of, well, this is a rough patch, you called it. Yeah, he admitted to me many times that the reason that he would call me those names and he treated me the way he did was because he didn't want me to leave. It was because he loved me so much. Even after he shot you, though, he refused to let you call 911. Correct. He said, you're just being greedy. You're just being selfish. Oh, you care about your legs. You don't care, I mean, you don't care about anybody or anybody. He shot you twice with an AK-47, and he's calling you selfish. Yes, he was upset that he would never see his kids again if he went to jail. So he was more worried about that. And yeah. when I was begging for help, he didn't care very much. So why does somebody do this? We're going to answer that question. Now, we reached out to Adam Brown's family, and they said, well, there's another side to this story that needs to be told, and that this is an issue that may affect more people than you would ever think. We'll be right back. stayed and I showed him I love you that that would motivate him to get help you got children with a drug using AK-47 armed that's not saving your family Adam's family has never liked me very much they've always treated me pretty poorly his family is supporting him. At the same time, they have been there for my children, but when it comes to me, nothing. Samantha says she was shot in the legs by her husband, Adam, who reportedly suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, let me give you a definition of post-traumatic stress disorder so you know what we're talking about here. It is an anxiety disorder that some people develop after seeing or living through an event that caused or threatened serious harm or death. Now, Adam says he does not remember pulling the trigger. We reached out to him, we reached out to his sister Diane, and she sent us the following email. I am writing you because my sister-in-law Samantha Brown is coming on your show due to my brother Adam Brown who has severe PTSD. Now, I would like to state what happened was awful. I would also like to state that she has abused Adam Brown for years. She ran over him with a car, stabbed him, and even threw a 10-pound ashtray at his eye, and he couldn't see for two weeks. She's been telling the news that she didn't know the gun was in the house, but the truth is that she did. Due to her drug use and bad parenting, the kids are not to be with her. When her husband would go to school, her five-year-old would be running around the complex asking neighbors for food for her and her younger brother, who is two now, because Samantha would be sleeping and would neglect to feed or change her children, her kids' diapers. I know you're a good judge of character and should see right through this girl. Uh, my brother, Adam Brown, is suffering from severe PTSD, and my heart goes out to him and every other war vet out there suffering from this disease. This is a tragedy that happened to Samantha. It's also a tragedy to Adam, who has to suffer from this disease, who loves his wife and kids, and wouldn't hurt a fly before the Army and now. So, what's your response to that? I'm, I'm amused by that. I never hung out with Diane, we've never been friends. We've never gotten along since the first day. She was telling me all kinds of stuff to stay away from Adam. He's a bad person. So for this, I, I don't even know what she's thinking, to be honest with you. Okay. You say there were times that you were physically combative with Adam. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and lie and tell you that the arguments weren't bad. Did you run over him with a car? I didn't run him over. We were in a parking lot and he got out of the car and I went to take off and then I went back to get him and I hit him, but it wasn't intentional. I couldn't see him. If I had hit him intentionally, I would have just done it. 
were there what I call discontinuation criteria here that looking back, and again, I say 2020 hindsight, looking back, that you say this, this was a deal breaker a long time ago, I stayed too long. Should you have gotten out of this relationship a long time ago? I honestly feel that I did everything that I could. Granted, this is what happened to me for staying, but I wanted my family. I still love my husband, and I would not change trying to save my family at all. If your mate is addicted to drugs and does not get serious professional help, I mean, right now, you're no longer living with your mate. You're now living with a drug addict. If they begin to abuse you mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, any way that they abuse you, that's a deal breaker. There are deal breakers where you have to say, that's it, I, this is not a family, this is not a marriage, and I am not going to be with this person unless and until an, an objective, independent professional tells me it's safe to go back there. You have children in that home, as you mentioned. You've got children with a drug-using AK-47 armed and firing a weapon. That, that's not saving your family. That's putting yourself and your children in harm's way. Absolutely. But, and for me, if, if he was sick, if he fell ill, I wouldn't just bail on him and leave him to, to fend for himself and, and to, I wanted to be there to support him. And I thought if I stayed and I showed him that I'm here with you no matter what, and I love you, that that would motivate him to get out. Right. And there's a point at which you focus on why, and then there's a point at which you focus on what. And you can focus on why he's doing what he's doing, and we're gonna do that in just a minute, but then you also need to focus on what he's doing. Because if somebody is shooting at me, I don't really care why. At that point, the what matters. What's happening is I'm getting shot. Why right now isn't important to me. And so we have to make those distinctions. And so if your husband is abusing you and therefore exposing your children to that kind of violence, we can worry about the why after we stop the what. After we stop the what's happening, then we'll worry about the why. And I'm saying this because I want you safe. And if you were arguing and throwing ashtrays at him and stabbing at him and hitting him with a car during a fight, or I, I don't care whether 10% of that, 20% of that's true, all of it's true or whatever, that's not good for you. It's not good for him and it escalates terribly. After all of this, why were Samantha's children taken away. What's going on there? We're going to talk about that next, and I'm going to talk about what I think contributed to this man turning an assault weapon on his own wife. We'll be right back. I love Adam until the day I die. I would have stayed with that man for the rest of my life if he just would have gotten help. I wanted it to be back to the way it was when we first got married. I believe in time I'll forgive him, but I don't think it's going to be any time soon. Adam is currently being held for evaluation in a mental health facility. If it turns out that he doesn't have PTSD, I want him prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I believe that he did try to murder me. I think his intention was to kill me. He should be charged with attempted murder. Well, Samantha says she is currently in recovery after her husband turned an AK-47 on her, opening fire during an argument at their home where he shot her in both legs. Now, both of her children were taken away by CPS. The state is claiming that because of the prior incident with his handgun, the fact that I stayed, I put my children in harm's way. Because of all of this, I am not allowed to see my children. My kids are staying with my sister. I stayed because I wanted to save my marriage. My whole life has been taken away from me. I have no job, I have no home, I have no money. 
My kids are gone now. I am a great mother. My kids are my reason for breathing. Knowing that I have to have supervised visits and I have to set an appointment to see my children, it breaks my heart. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that that's the circumstance. And th they're telling you basically what I'm telling you, right? They're saying that you went beyond what was in the best interest of the children in an effort to say I wanted to save my marriage. And, and so they, what they're saying essentially is that that was negligence. And so they're going to want to see that that has changed and I'm gonna help you make that happen, okay? I'm gonna help you make that happen. I think you were well intended, but I, I think that was a bad decision. And I think you agree with me in retrospect, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I said, why did this happen? And I, I want to talk about that um, for a minute. Um, when, when we talk about PTSD, and do, do you think that your husband suffers from PTSD? I honestly don't know. I never saw any symptoms of the PTSD. I didn't know what to look for, and I never saw anything on paper or heard from any doctors that it was he was, in fact, diagnosed with it. Well, you just said, you said, I didn't know what to look for. And that's why I said this is a cautionary tale. Let me tell you what some of the symptoms are of PTSD. Dreams and nightmares intrusive recollections where involuntarily whatever has happened, things that you have seen, uh, maybe you were in a car wreck. It isn't just for veterans. I mean, it could be a car wreck. It could be something horrible in your life. But for them, you know, seeing friends blown up, getting blown up, being traumatized, those recollections come back. Uh, reliving the trauma as illusions, hallucinations, and dissociative flashbacks. Intense psychological distress if certain cues happen. You're walking down the street and some kid shoots off a firecracker. It would scare anyone if you weren't expecting it, but these folks would respond to it in a very dramatic fashion. Physiological reaction to those cues. Avoiding thoughts and feelings or conversations. It's like they just don't want to deal with emotions. Avoiding activities, places, or people. They tend to become withdrawn. Feelings of detachment and irritable or aggressive behavior. And the PTS warning signs that abuse may occur, a history of past battering, threats of violence, breaking objects, use of force during arguments, jealousy, controlling behavior, quick involvement in relationships, verbal abuse, blaming others for problems, cruelty to children, animals, abrupt mood changes, any of these things that a person might see would mean you've got a precursor to abuse. And that is problematic. Now, I, I, I say this not to excuse his behavior at all. At some point, you have to focus on what, not why. What he did was pull out an assault rifle and shoot his wife. That's not okay. But we also have to understand we, we've got some serious problems happening associated with family members of combat veterans with PTSD. One researcher reports that 50% of treatment-seeking veterans with PTSD or combat-related mental health issues commit wife battering and family violence. 50%. I just thought he was grouchy and depressed. Male veterans with PTSD are two to three times more likely than veterans without PTSD to engage in intimate partner violence. And the majority of these veterans with combat stress commit at least one act of spousal abuse in their first year of post-deployment. What I'm saying here is there are so many victims in this situation that it's heartbreaking. You clearly are a victim here. Samantha, I'm, I, I hate that this has happened to you. I, here we have a man that went to a war 
You know, he didn't start it. He didn't, he didn't want to be in all of that mess, but there he is. And he comes back with what I believe is a very likely disorder. I haven't met him. I haven't evaluated him. I don't know. And I've seen some of his records, not all of them. But it has to be on the short list of considerations. Had I known beforehand about the PTSD, had I been able to get him to open up to me instead of getting angry with me when I wanted to discuss it with him, maybe things would have been different. But he didn't, he didn't talk to me. He didn't, there was no communication about it. You've been shot. Your kids have been taken away. You have every right to be bitter. We did reach out to Adam's family for a statement, and they sent us the following letter along with a copy of some of his psychological report from the VA. This is their letter. Since returning from active duty, Adam changed from a quiet, decent young man to a depressed, quiet, sullen individual who began drinking, experimenting with drugs, and showed at times serious anger issues. He's been hospitalized on numerous occasions at the VA for depression, alcohol abuse, and drug abuse. He experienced several seizures associated with medications prescribed and was reluctant to continue taking the medications. He's been steadily going downhill and his family feels he has given up. His attorney unsuccessfully attempted several times to have Adam transferred to the VA for treatment and the VA claims not to have the facilities to treat him. We continue to not only try to help Adam, but also his wife and especially his two children. We are deeply sorry for the events that took place, but feel the proper medical attention was seriously lacking. Thank you for your help, the Brown family. So that's what they have to say. And um, are they trying to kind of minimize and excuse? And I mean, they're his parents. I, mean, I, I totally understand that, and I agree with everything that they that they stated in that in that letter. The only thing is. As far as supporting me, I've talked to his mom two, maybe three times since this happened, yeah. not to his father at all. Not yeah. The only time I talked to his grandmother was when she called and asked me to call the DI on mm -hmm. his behalf. Um, so mm -hmm. as far as my kids, yes, absolutely, they take my children every weekend to help my sister out. They're wonderful to my kids. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and dispute that. Everything they said is true. Mm -hmm. You know, he was an amazing person. <clears throat> when he came back from Iraq, he was completely different. Okay, and, and you see what I'm saying, and again, I am not excusing, and you have every right to be bitter and upset, and I mean, you've been shot, your kids have been taken away. This is a horrible situation and circumstance. Has CPS given you an action plan for getting your children back? I'm still waiting to hear from the case planner. They were supposed to call me. I haven't okay. heard anything yet. Well, we're, I, I can tell you what some of that is going to involve. It's going to involve some training as a parent. They're going to want to know that you've had conversations like we're having right now. They're going to want you to complete some protocols um, of, of parent training and that sort of thing, which I know you will happily do, and you're a very bright Absolutely. young Absolutely, and I want counseling for myself anyway. I right. don't think that I'll be able to continue my life well, normally listen, without I, it. We, we want to help fast-track that situation with CPS and getting you that training and getting you that help and getting you on your feet. Um, you made some really bad choices. You, you failed to make some right decisions. Um, I think you see that now and more as we talk about it. That was then, this is now. Let's make sure you have the right tools and move ahead. Because, and, and these children were in harm's way. I mean, in retrospect, you see that, right? Uh, because irrational people sometimes victimize the children even rather than, than their spouse. And coming up, we're going to talk to a woman who experienced the greatest horror a mother could ever experience at the hands of her ex-husband. And you will understand how badly this can go. There were no 
no signs at all that Andre was a violent person. I didn't stop and kill my son, uh, stop myself. I would have gladly taken the bullet for my children, but I wasn't given that choice. My next guest, Lori, says when she got married, she thought her husband was the love of her life. She never imagined he would turn in to this. I was married to Andre for 11 years. We had two children, Alec and Asher. Everything was great until he revealed that he was living this secret life. He said he had been with 27 prostitutes. I was shocked. Ultimately, I decided to divorce him. He was angry and wanted me back. There were no signs at all that Andre was a violent person. On March 30th, I dropped Alec and Asher off to Andre. On March 31st at 7 in the morning, my cell phone rang. I saw that it was Andre. I didn't pick it up. Two minutes later, my old neighbor called and said, Lori, the SWAT team is at Andre's house. I pulled up to the complex and I knew something was horribly wrong. I didn't stop and kill my son, I stopped myself. You did what? I asked the officer if Alec was okay and he said no. He shot Alec. And then I asked if Ashi was okay and he said no, he killed him too. One moment my life was normal and the next minute my life as I knew it vaporized. And then I asked, what of Andre? He shot himself and the bullet just went out his cheek. Sir, where did you get shot? What part of your body did you shoot yourself? Okay. Like this. So there were four bullets, one for Alec, one for Asher, one for me, and one for him. And I would have gladly taken the bullet for my children, but I wasn't given that choice. The murder-suicide note said, you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. It was addressed to me, and Alec was just learning how to write, so he spelled his name. And Asher, it's 15 months, he just went like this. The Valley father who shot and killed his two young sons has been sentenced to death. He took two lives, and unless someone or something can bring my children back, there is never going to be a sense of justice. Well, Lori, I'm so glad, glad to meet you, but so sorry that it's for this circumstance. How did this happen? Um, I, don't, I don't know what was going on through his mind. I married my best friend. I, I loved him, and he was a great guy. We had everything. I don't know how someone gets from one place to the next other than he had a thought that it would be a, it would hurt me, it would destroy me if he hurt the children. But why did he want to destroy you? When I first found out that he was with and escort. We went through 18 months of intensive family counseling. Right. And I was calling his bluff. I said, I know that you've been with more w women than that night. Expecting him to say no. And he turned around and he said, you're right. And I, I, I just, it was surreal. And the next morning he came down and he said, 27. And I said, 27 what? And at that point, I knew, I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I knew I needed my space. And I knew I had to leave. I had to leave for my kids. How did he take that in that moment? In that moment, he understood. But one moment he would understand and then Two days later, he would be angry. I was always looking at the children because I think that the children were also going to give me this nonverbal feedback. 
and they loved him. He loved them. All right, well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what happened when Lori faced her children's killer in court. We'll be right back. Every day I wake up and I live every parent's worst nightmare that their kids were killed. But I can't live in that space. And I'm not just going to survive. I'm not going to live here tormented by what happened to my children. I live as if nothing is forever. It's just for right now. Well, we're talking with Lori, whose husband, Andre, um, is currently in prison on death row for killing their two small children during their bitter divorce. Now, Lori says she got the last word in court when she faced off against her ex-husband. Let's listen to part of the audio tape. I have waited almost three years to look at you and to tell you a few things. I have never imagined that I would be standing here facing you as the murderer of our children. And the fortunate part is that you didn't have the courage to finish your act of killing yourself. You are not mentally ill. You killed our children. You are the stupidest person I have ever met. You are the stupidest person because I loved you. Andre, you killed the two people who loved you. Alan loved you. And you, you killed him. I do have hate for you. But you know, I also have the ability to love. But my happiness does not lie in Alec and Usher. It can't, or I'll die. It lies within me. And you couldn't take away my happiness. You are 100% responsible for the death of Alec and Usher. And you know it here. I miss them every day. They're so sweet. It's, um, They're so sweet. Of course they are. And Thank you. How are you... How are you coping with this now? How are you changed? Well, you know, one moment my life was normal, and the next moment I couldn't recognize my life. Have you grieved the loss of these children? I've, I grieve, I miss them, I, every day. Every day is Mother's Day without my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's grief and then there's trauma and then there's this. And the person who is supposed to protect them didn't. You know, as parents, we believe that we're supposed to protect our kids. <clears throat> and I've, for a long time, I blamed myself because I was supposed to protect them. But I didn't even know that they were in danger. So it, I've traveled a million miles grieving their loss, and I still do. Do you still blame yourself for this? No. Because it sure sounds like it, because you sure said, I was supposed to protect them, and I didn't. That sounds like unfinished emotional business to me. That was my truth for a long time. And to even, to even <clears throat> talk about those beliefs are so poisonous that that's the space that I couldn't live in. We're going to talk about how to move forward even from the most horrific of circumstances when we come back. Well, our Twitter has just been blowing up during this whole show about uh, both of the, these women that we've talked to. Helen Lusk, 1957, says, 
about your story, Lori. She says, what an inspirational and strong woman. Uh, Jenny Kettle says, I'm sobbing right now at this woman's ability to demonstrate such strength and love. Uh, Healed Hearts says, you must grieve and you must forgive yourself. It is not your fault. And that came in right before we actually talked about that. And um, so uh, at this point, you know, people are looking at you and saying, how do you put one foot in front of the other and keep going? But Lori did find love again. She's married to her current husband, Alejandro. Uh, She married him on September 17th of 2011 and is now a stepmother. (laughs) And is now a stepmother to his two young daughters. So may God visit you with peace for all the rest of your days. Uh, I mean, seriously. Um, You know, we we talked earlier about PTSD. I'll put all of that information for you uh, on drphil.com so you can recognize if maybe you're in that situation or a loved one is, and then you know how to reach out for help. I want to thank all of my guests today. Thanks for being here so long.